LinkedIn presents. Imagine for a moment that it's your job to try and solve one of the world's most intractable problems, extreme poverty. You have billions of dollars at your disposal, an eager beaver team of experts ready to carry out your plans. What would you do? The conventional wisdom says, build schools and hospitals, dig wells, pave roads, fight disease. That's what we've done for years. And on the surface, it looks like it's worked. Worldwide, the percentage of people living in extreme poverty has come down. But zoom in on a place like sub-Saharan Africa, and the picture changes. Yes, the percentage has improved, but the total number of people living in extreme poverty has more than doubled since 1980. 430 million people there live on less than $2.15 a day. So maybe the whole top-down infrastructure thing isn't working. But what's the alternative? Well, what if I told you the solution is so simple, it's been overlooked for years? Just give people cash. I'm Caleb Bissinger, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, why is it that sometimes the most effective solutions are the ones we're most reluctant to try? That job I just described, it's not made up. Rory Stewart actually had it. As the UK's Secretary of State for International Development, he oversaw a budget of $20 billion. And he used that money in all the conventional wisdom ways you'd expect. But then one day, he goes to see the sanitation project that his team's been working on in Africa. So I get in my car, I drive out to see the first one of these schools in rural Zambia. Step out of the car. And the first thing I see is a row of very smart white jeeps. You have to listen to the rest of the episode to find out what he saw. But I can tell you this. It completely upended everything he thought he knew about fighting global poverty. And it forced him to ask some really tough questions. After 30 years working in international development, he began to wonder, how much impact was he really having? And it was at that point that I left government. And after he left, he became an unlikely champion for a radical idea that maybe, just maybe, all the experts and engineers and elaborate plans were getting it wrong. Maybe the best way to eradicate poverty is just to put cash straight into the pockets of poor people. No strings attached. Rory's voice may sound familiar. I spoke with him back in December about his book, How Not to Be a Politician, a memoir about the dispiriting decade he spent as a member of parliament in the UK. In that episode, I described Rory as the most interesting person you've probably never heard of. And I stand by that. Highlights from his colorful life include tutoring Prince William and Prince Harry, working as a diplomat in Montenegro and Indonesia, walking across Afghanistan alone just a few months after 9-11, governing two Iraqi provinces, helping to rebuild the old city of Kabul, teaching at Harvard, and running for prime minister in an ill-fated attempt to stop Boris Johnson. But today, we're going to focus on what Roy's been up to since leaving politics. He's launched one of Britain's most popular podcasts, he's teaching at Yale, and he's devoted much of his time and energy to a nonprofit called Give Directly, where he served as president and now senior advisor. This whole put cash in people's pockets thing that I've been talking about That's what GiveDirectly does. They've distributed $800 million to more than 1.6 million people all over the world, including right here in the US. These unconditional cash transfers have been extensively studied, and the results consistently show reductions in things like childhood mortality and depression, and improvements in education, health, income, business creation. And yet the notion of just giving people money still makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Why is that? If cash transfers are really the panacea that the research and Rory say they are, why do they only account for like 2% of global aid budgets? What am I missing here? So when Rory got back in touch and proposed a follow-up conversation focused on cash transfers and UBI, 
I jumped at the opportunity to ask him that question. SAP Business AI is embedded across SAP solutions to drive immediate impact. Make confident decisions using your own data with top-tier security and privacy. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Hey, I'm Gianna Prudenti. And I'm Jamae Jackson Gadsden. We're the hosts of Let's Talk Offline from LinkedIn News and iHeart Podcasts. There's a lot to figure out when you're just starting your career. That's where we come in. Think of us as your work besties you can turn to for advice. And if we don't know the answer, we bring in people who do, like negotiation expert Maury Tahiri Poor. If you start thinking about negotiations as just a conversation, then I think it sort of eases us a little bit. Listen to Let's Talk Offline on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Rory Stewart, welcome back to the next big idea. Thank you for having me back. You are currently co-host of the UK's most popular podcast. You are co-director of the Grand Strategy Program at Yale. You're a senior advisor to Give Directly. But I want to actually begin by asking you about one of your old jobs. You were previously the UK's Secretary of State for International Development. This is a cabinet-level position. It's sort of comparable in the U.S. to, to running USAID. What exactly is that job? What was your day-to-day? What were you doing? I was in charge of the UK's development program. And in those days, we were committed to spending 0.7% of our economy on international aid. So that meant that we had a budget of about $20 billion a year. And it was dedicated exclusively to addressing extreme poverty. You've been in the international development space for a long time. Was this the culmination of of like a lifelong dream? Was this like, did you feel you'd reached the the peak of the mountain when when you got that role? Yeah, I mean, to some extent, absolutely, of course. You know, I'd been in international development, I guess now for almost 30 years. I'd worked in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Indonesia run my own nonprofits, I had implemented government projects, and, and here was this incredible opportunity to be in charge of one of the largest development organizations anywhere in the world with completely unrestricted control over this cash. I mean, that's the other very unique thing about the British system, that under law, nobody could tell me what to do. The prime minister and others couldn't put pressure on us on how we spend our money. We were supposed to just follow the evidence and put it into whatever the evidence showed us. But obviously hidden within my answer is the sense that it was pretty frustrating. Say a little bit more about that frustration, because I get the sense that the deeper you got into this, the more you began to question the efficacy of some of the projects you were, you were helping to spearhead. Well, the, the discovery, of course, is firstly that the projects themselves the closer you got to them, the more disappointing and frustrating they were. And I can talk a little bit more about that. I have a very dramatic example from Zambia of an incredibly wasteful and depressing project that I visited quite early on. In theory, the project was amazing. If you read it on paper, the idea was very exciting. It was that we were going to provide sanitation for young women going to school. And by providing sanitation for them, particularly during their monthly cycle, we would allow them to have another seven years in education because a lot of girls were dropping out of education at the age of 12. And this would transform the number of girls being educated in Zambia. And $40,000 have been allocated for each school. Imagine a 150-page strategic plan. There are monitoring mechanisms. We're partnering with the United Nations. There are all these engineers. And so I get in my car. I drive out to see the first one of these schools in rural Zambia. Step out of the car, and the first thing I see is a row of very smart white jeeps, and in them are a lot of foreigners who are not Africans, they're Europeans, they're Indians, who are engineers who are studying this water project. They all come out, they smile, they greet me, and they take me to see the project. And I'm thinking, okay, how did we spend $40,000 in this school? And what they show me are two holes in the ground with a small brick wall around them, like little toilets that are just holes in the ground, not plumbed. 
and five red plastic buckets. So I said, well, what's with the plastic buckets? And they say, well, the girls can take these buckets to the well, which I think was about 300 meters away, fill it full of water, and then come back and they can pour the water over their hands with some soap and they can wash their hands. So I said, but why, you know, is there no plumbing or anything? No, 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 Minister, we've studied this very closely and we've decided this is the most appropriate technology. It can't go wrong. They're just plastic buckets and it'll be fine. So I say, well, why does this cost $40,000, right? Why didn't you just give $2,000 to the head teacher and let him dig a couple of holes in the ground and buy five red plastic buckets and he'd have hundreds of dollars left over to do other stuff in the school? And they said, well, we were worried that he might steal the money. And my response is, we stole the money. We literally stole 38000 out of $40,000 here. Now, we didn't think we were stealing the money because the money was spent on salaries, it was spent on monitoring and evaluation, it was spent on logical frameworks, strategic plans, engineering designs, diagrams, backup visits, anti-corruption monitoring, reporting mechanisms. But the truth of the matter is that we could have done 20 times as many schools for that money. And so what was that plane ride home like? What what are you you thinking? Are you thinking, oh my gosh, this isn't working and we need to change course? Yeah, I'm thinking this is totally crazy. And of course, it was just one out of dozens of these things. I mean, this isn't, I'm not just producing the one thing that went wrong almost every project. You know, I would go to Nigeria and find clinics with no patients in them and no medicines on the shelves. I would go to vocational training schools and find that people had spent six months studying carpentry in a classroom without being able to hold a saw and all the saws were locked up in a cupboard. I mean, I just would see the stuff again and again and again and again, right? And I realized that when I challenged the bureaucracy, they didn't really know what to say. This was the way they did things and they couldn't really think about doing them in any other ways. And remember, these were projects that my staff was so proud of, they would taking me to see them. Right. These presumably were the very best of the best. <laughs> and it was at that point that still completely confused, bewildered, feeling that I was achieving very little, that I'd got to this job, which was the kind of pinnacle of my career. And we were achieving so little. I remember Malawi, for example, was a country where we were putting in an enormous amount of money, you know, over a hundred million a year. Yet I was very aware that in 40 years of British development programs in Malawi, Malawi was still very, very poor, one of the poorest countries. And I couldn't see what impact we'd had in 40 years. And it was at that point that I left government. And then, I guess a few years later, you find yourself in Rwanda looking at a completely different kind of project aimed at addressing extreme poverty. And that was an eye-opener for you. Tell, Tell me about that. So I I turned up on the Rwanda-Burundi border. So imagine driving for about four and a half hours down a dirt track, very, very bumpy, out to an area of people largely living in earth buildings. They have nothing really inside their houses, so they're sleeping on the floor. They can barely afford any livestock. Most of the people don't have any electricity, access to clean water. It's about as poor as you can get. Many of the children are not in school. Many people are malnourished. And this NGO, Give Directly, that I was visiting, was just giving cash to people, a lump sum cash payment. And they literally turn up. You'd find a, a woman, an elderly woman, who's looking after three grandchildren in a small earth building. And you would give her $700 in cash and allow her to decide what to do with the money. And 93% of the money was hitting the ground. So it was completely the opposite of Zambia. In Zambia, we were using $38,000 out of $40,000 managing, monitoring salaries. Here, almost everything was just getting the cash to someone and then stepping back and letting them do it. And I was profoundly shocked initially. I thought these people are absolutely crazy. Hmm. You know, how can this make any sense? Part of me thought, wait wait a second, what happens? The villagers waste the money. But part of me thought, 
But what about the whole development industry? I mean, what's the point of us all doing master's degrees in international development Mm -hmm. if we're just giving cash? And then part of me thought that we were brought up to think, give someone a fish they eat for a day, teach them to fish they eat for a lifetime. And this is like a massive fish giving program. It's completely unsustainable. This is totally mad. This isn't development. And then I discovered, in fact, that I was completely wrong. What pushed you over the edge? What made you realize, oh, wait a second, I was wrong, and there's something here, something really powerful? Well, the first thing I saw was a village which had received the money three months earlier. Mm. And it looked completely different. (laughs) You had gone from about a third of the people having electricity to three quarters. Almost everybody had ended up being able to own a cow. The number of kids in school had shot up. People just were better fed. Uh, Their roofs were fixed. Everybody had a latrine. You suddenly had businesses growing. Every house looked better. The fields looked better. It smelt different because there was manure and fertilizer on the fields. And all of this had happened without any foreigners telling people what to do. This was the Mm. cash and the individual decisions of all those houses making their own lives better so quickly. And I realized that if I had, if I was still in my old job and we'd gone in in the way that the United Nations would or the World Bank would or USAID would or the British government would, and we had said, we're going to commission some experts and engineers to do all those things. You know, we want to get nutrition improved. We want to get the kids into school. We want to get electricity. We want to get sanitation. We want to fix the houses. We want we would have spent millions trying to do it. Yeah. And this had been achieved for about $100,000. And it was then that I realized that the whole idea of give someone a fish to eat for a day, teach them to fish to eat for a lifetime was completely wrong. And then I began to look at the research and I began to realize that this wasn't a freak accident. Mm -hmm. That people were running randomized control trials like the kind of trial you'd run to test a a medical product. You know, villages that don't receive cash, villages that do receive cash, and measuring them over time. And this was consistent. It was outperforming almost every other development intervention conceivable. And the scale, I think, of what GiveDirectly had done and and came to do was pretty large too, right? I mean, it's given, I think, $800 million directly to over one and a half million people around the world, right? So this is not a couple of tiny isolated pilots. There's a lot more to go, but that, that those are very impressive numbers. It's It's unbelievable. It's really unbelievable. This was a small project which was begun by uh, a handful of of young American graduate students who started with a little bit of money from their family and grew it. And it's been built off the back of some incredibly talented local staff in Africa, Mm -hmm. in Kenya, in Rwanda. And as you say, they have proved that one of the things that makes cash so special is that you can take it to scale. I was talking to, says he name dropping a little bit about, uh, to Bill Gates about education programs. And he was pointing out to me that doing international education is difficult because you can get one exceptional school, but Mm -hmm. it's very difficult scaling it because the one exceptional school is an incredibly dedicated head teacher, incredibly dedicated teaching staff in one community. But cash is different. Cash is almost by definition the most scalable, straightforward thing in the world. You know, it it can work in Rwanda, it can work in Uganda, it can work in Kenya, it can work in Bangladesh. And and that makes it quite unique. You don't need all the infrastructure and specialist knowledge that you need to do to do something very complicated like set up your own school. Yeah. It could work in the US too. I think we'll talk about that a little bit later. So so you became president of Give Directly. Just tell me quickly, sort of, what is the process of one of these projects look like? What, what is, how does it operate? Mm. Okay, so um, what happens is we will work with the United Nations and the host government to identify the poorest communities in the country. Then we'll send out a team to check. Once we're confident that these are people who are really in need, 
then you send out a team that explains to them that we will be coming in a couple of months' time and we'll be doing a cash distribution program through the mobile phones because right. in Africa, people use mobile phones as bank accounts and it's a very good way of transferring money efficiently and safely. We will explain how much money's coming and we will encourage them to visit a neighboring community that's already received the money and to start thinking about what they might do with the money when it arrives. And then two months later, the cash distribution starts and usually it comes in a couple of installments. And then we will follow up, usually on the phone, to find out how people use the money. And sometimes we'll partner with universities around the world to do a big randomized control trial to compare with other places to gather data. But we don't need to do that all the time because we've now proved in more, you know, right. hundreds of these studies that it works. I think the interesting thing for me is the realizing how it works. And mm. th I think there are three things that I, I, I realized about these programs, which blows up this story about fish. The first is that one of the things that's holding people back often is not knowledge, but cash. Mm. You know, they, they know what kind of business they want to do, but they need to be able to buy a bicycle, you know, get, get a small mm -hmm. generator, they don't buy some biscuits to stock it. In other words, if we return to teaching someone to fish, they already know how to fish. They just don't have the money to buy the fishing rod. The second thing is that everybody in a village is treated often by traditional programs as though their needs are the same. So everybody's going to get the same nutrition sure. program, same education. But cash is very individualized. It's like water falling on a mountain landscape. It will adapt to all the different nooks and crannies. So you may want to focus, I don't know, on getting your kids into school. I may want to be starting a small business. You may want to be getting an, your aunt into hospital. I may want to fix my roof, etc. cetera. Um, in other words, somebody doesn't want to learn how to fish. They want to open a bakery, for example, right? And then the final thing is, of course, that the villagers will do it far more cheaply than an outsider. If I give you the cash, you get your cousin in, you can fix up your house for a fraction of the cost that an international NGO coming in with engineers and procuring all the equipment would would do. Because you're trying to make your money go as far as possible. I have to just say, as an aside, that I, I was curious about the origins of the give a man a fish proverb. So I right. did a little research. And oh, it yes. seems like it, it traces back to Anne Thackeray Ritchie, who was a 19th century English writer. Uh -huh. And the funny thing about her is that she inherited from her father the equivalent of what today would be about $3 million. Right. So talk about a cash transfer, <laughs> right? <laughs> Well, it's it's an amazing thing though because it, it and you can see why it would appeal to Victorians because it's quite patronizing if you think about that phrase. Basically, what you're implying is that what poor people lack is knowledge, and 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 we, the kind of wealthy global north, have that knowledge. You know, we also like it because it means we don't have to reach into our pockets. We can just turn up and pontificate at them and lecture them, but we don't actually have to give them our cash. Right. Still, didn't the Victorians have a point? Were they right to worry that if you give a man a fish, he'll go out and get drunk? Okay, I feel like the analogy is falling apart here, but you know what I mean. When we come back, Rory and I answer that question with help from ChatGPT. Tired of AI hype without results? SAP Business AI isn't just talk. It's embedded across SAP solutions, driving immediate impact for your organization. From Jewel, your digital assistant, to AI-powered capabilities throughout the SAP portfolio, SAP Business AI helps you make confident decisions based on your own data, all while maintaining the highest security and privacy standards for growth-focused businesses. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. As you probably know, Britain had an election over the summer. And Rory co-hosted the live coverage on the UK's Channel 4. After weeks of campaigning, you've heard all the sound bites, seen the publicity stunts, and endured endless polls. Listen to politicians' countless promises and big ideas. That's Rory making fun of big ideas. Thanks a lot, Rory. Just kidding. Anyway, this photo from election night went kind of viral. It's of Rory sitting at the anchor's desk, laptop in front of him, open to ChatGPT. 
people got upset. They accused him of using AI to do his homework for him. He went on his podcast, The Rest is Politics, and defended himself, called AI, quote, an incredible assistant. And when I spoke to him a few days ago, he said, I worship ChatGPT. Where am I going with all this? Okay, given Rory's AI fandom, I thought it'd be interesting to ask ChatGPT for the best arguments against cash transfers, against the kind of work that GiveDirectly does. And then I read them to Rory. Here's what happened. All right, number one. People might just blow the money on booze and cigarettes instead of using it for important stuff. Some people will misuse the money, but we have really good data at a population level, and we consistently find the people who receive cash, their incomes go up, their savings go up, businesses increase, school enrollment increases, nutrition gets better. Now, that may mean that what we're talking about is an average impact. In other words, there may be some people who are misusing the money, but the evidence suggests that is much, much less than you would believe. Mm -hmm. And it's also true that you're not comparing the alternative. I mean, that's what you always have to ask with cash. What's the alternative? So USCID very kindly funded us to give $3 million in cash against $3 million in business support training from another NGO. And what they discovered is that the business support package, three years later, they could find literally no impact at all on the number of businesses. Wow. Whereas the cash had led to an appreciable increase in the number of people having businesses and in their savings and their incomes. So even in the rare cases that some people are misusing it, overall, the whole program is having far more impacts on far more lives than the alternatives. Why bother getting a job when you're getting free money from the government? Well, uh, these programs are not a monthly stipend. Our most successful programs at the moment are a one-time transfer of cash. So this is a chance to invest in buying the bicycle, fixing your roof, a chance to install a latrine, a chance to get some electricity. This is not the money that you're going to be living on. And you're also unbelievably poor. I mean, if you think about it, these are people who are living on the equivalent of $1.50 a day. You know, they're struggling to eat once every two days. Even if you give them $1,000, yes, that appreciably improves their lives. But my goodness, they still have to work. I mean, they, they're, they're still amongst the very poorest people in the world. I mean, you, you've taken them out of extreme poverty, but that is not... Um, not money that somebody's going to retire on. If everyone suddenly got extra cash to spend, won't that just make everything else more expensive? Well, that's a very good challenge. And that's a good normal bit of economics, which is worries about inflation. So we've had to study that very closely. The answer, of course, is that not everybody is getting it at the same time. And it's quite important to make sure to control for this, that you think carefully about what proportion of the population is receiving this and how big this is in relation to the economy as a whole. Mm -hmm. But we've done careful studies this in Kenya and discovered that the, my apologies for people listening, this is a Scottish mm -hmm. clock going on in the background, it won't go on forever. Um, we've done careful- I should just pause quickly yep, and describe yep. for listeners where Rory is right now. You look, there's maybe one flickering bulb above your head <laughs> that looks like it's gonna go out at any minute in this interview. <laughs> You have some beautiful bookcases behind you. Uh, it's August. Here in the States, it's 90 degrees, but clearly in Scotland, it's freezing cold. You're wearing a turtleneck. Um, anyway. <laughs> as you you're, were saying. You're seeing the other, the, exactly, some vision of kind of some strange decaying Scottish house. Um, yeah, so the, the studies in Kenya showed that there wasn't a significant inflation impact. And the reason for that is that the extreme poor in these countries are a relatively small part of the economy, even if there are a lot of people. Mm. So in Rwanda, they could be 37% of the population. But the total economy could be you know, $10 billion a year. And the amount of money going into these communities, even if we were really, really successful in a single country, would be 50, 100 million. And if it's spread across the country, it doesn't have an appreciable impact on the basic commodity prices. 
Here's the last chat GPT criticism. Where's all this money coming? I love the tone, by the way. Chat GPT is very <laughs> sort of irritated. <laughs> Where's all the money coming from? The government can't just keep handing out cash forever, can it? So, particularly when you're talking about the poorest people in the world um, in sub-Saharan Africa, one of the things that we're not saying to an American or a British taxpayer is you're going to have to do this forever. What we're saying is we want to transform the lives of the people in this village through a one-time cash payment allow them to invest in their own lives and improve them. But we're not setting up here a welfare state where you're going to be asked for the next 40, 50 years to fund people's lifestyle because that doesn't seem to me to be politically conceivable or possible. And actually, some of our research suggests that a one-time payment actually leads to more productive investments than a monthly stipend anyway. I think what you would also say too, maybe, is that we currently spend twice as much on international development as it would take to lift almost everyone in the world out of extreme poverty, right? So it's it's actually not even true that this would be a massive change to, to budgets necessarily. That, that's right. And um, I also remember a U.S. congressman being asked this question by an audience who said, look, people are struggling in the U.S. And he said, that's right. You know, I don't deny it. People are struggling yeah. in the US, but people are struggling a hell of a lot more in some of these other countries. I mean, it's it's inconceivable, the levels of poverty that people are living in. And just to put this in perspective for listeners, I mean, we're talking about 700 million people around the world living on less than $2.15 a day. Yeah. And, and, and bringing that to life is that's people who really are struggling to eat more than once every two days. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, it, it's, you have to get the balance right here because these are incredibly dignified people living independent lives and you don't want to belittle them mm -hmm. by telling sob stories. But the truth of the matter is that these are very difficult, bleak lives. I mean, any idea that, you know, they're sort of poor but happy is just not true. It, it, it's miserable. You know, I was talking to a woman who in the evening puts um, stones in boiling water on the fire so that the children think something is cooking slowly and slowly fall asleep believing that something's cooking, but actually there's no food and they won't eat again until the next day. You name dropped Bill Gates a little while ago. You had him on your podcast leading earlier this year, and you asked him why the Gates Foundation isn't writing multi-billion dollar checks to give cash directly to people. And he said, Malaria kills are happening children every year. I don't care if you write them a check. That's not a good thing. The direct giving thing is interesting, but you know, if I gave all the money that we spend each year, you know, it'd be like a dollar fifty a year and nobody would work on, on malaria. You didn't really get a chance to respond to him in that, in that episode, so I want to give you that opportunity now. What, what do you wish you had said to Bill Gates in that moment? My interactions with Bill Gates over the years that <laughs> never go very far, because he's, he's very smart and he's very argumentative, and he's got very, very fixed views on the world, so I don't think I can change his mind however much I replay these conversations. But if, if I were talking to you and you had somehow found yourself in charge of a foundation that size, I would say to you, look, let's demonstrate in one country how this works. I'm not asking you to give a dollar fifty to 700 million people. I'm asking you to partner in a small country like Rwanda, support, let's say, three and a half million people, easily within your budget and demonstrate over five years that we can lift those people out of poverty for a relatively small amount of money quite efficiently, and then go to the World Bank, to the UN, to the international development agencies and say, listen, the Gates Foundation has just demonstrated in Rwanda that for a pretty small amount of money, you can lift everybody out of poverty, right? So why don't you replicate this in other countries? And if I, I would want to say to him, when I was the Secretary of State for International Development, when I had that 20,000 million dollar a year budget, 20 billion a year budget. If someone had been able to come to me and say, look, 
we've demonstrated that for two or three billion dollars, you can lift an entire country like Rwanda out of poverty. You could do 10 of these countries a year. That would really make me wake up. But what we need is the great philanthropist to partner at scale. You must be talking about this with other major philanthropists, and it seems like it has been difficult to get some of these yeah. th- these folks on on board. Why why is that? It's an exercise in radical humility, I'm afraid, hmm. because you have to say that what I really have to contribute here is my cash, not my kind of business genius, not my knowledge, not some fancy tech product that I've developed. Mm-hmm. My cash. And that's difficult for people to do. I remember in London talking to a major philanthropist who said to me, oh, I've realized as I've gone on that you know the best thing I contribute is not my cash, it's my knowledge. And I just thought, wait a sec, you run a business supplying sandwiches to Heathrow Airport. I mean, what on earth is this knowledge that you think that's relevant? to somebody in a village in Malawi. What are you doing? You're moving to Malawi? You understand how somebody living on two dollars? I mean, what you have to contribute, I'm afraid, is your cash. And now, I have spent quite a lot of my life living in other people's countries. And all that that's taught me is how little I understand about the lives of the extreme poor on the Rwanda-Burundi border. How ridiculous it would be for me to fantasize that I've got some new tech product or invention or something that I can sort of go to their village and transform. The the thing that I have that they lack is cash. But I think you would admit that cash can't solve all problems, right? I mean, it can't eradicate malaria, as as Bill Gates says. And so so what what are the limits of cash? What are the things it just cannot do and that we still need more traditional development to do? So in very simple terms, if you have a very specific target in mind, in other words, the only thing you're interested in is eliminating malaria, then you have to do a malaria program because if you give people cash unconditionally, they can choose to spend it on a bed net or they can choose to spend it on digging a latrine or getting their kids into school. So if all you care about is reducing the amount of malaria, buy them a bed net. The second thing that cash is less good at is public goods. Mm. So if you're talking about building a highway or a hydroelectric dam or a hospital or a school system, it's got to be public money. What the cash is doing is allowing the extreme poor to access that service. And so in many cases, the World Bank or the Chinese government will lend the money to these governments to build big hospitals, build big roads, do those big infrastructure projects. Often because with things like dams and roads, they can actually make the money back through tolls and electricity revenue. What the cash does is it allows the very poor village to get to those things, to have the Mm -hmm. money to get to that hospital, to get their products down that road, to be able to connect to that electricity from that dam. But yeah, you still need the governments. I mean, but but most of the big infrastructure, the governments can borrow the money. Where you need philanthropic cash is is for those very, very poor private households. But I also think, sorry, just to push back on the malaria one more time, and this is me maybe being a little bit more radical. I actually think that that woman on the Miranda Burundi border should get to choose. She Hmm. should get to think, okay, is my priority putting this money into not getting malaria or would I prefer to get my kids into school? Because it's a a zero-sum game, right? And, And I saw this at a pretty dramatic level. There are vaccination programs now running, which in total are costing about $300 per individual. So Mm -hmm. three people in the family could be vaccinated for about the $1,000 that we're giving. So the family can either choose to get vaccinated, which is very important and great and has huge impacts on life expectancy mortality, or they can choose to get the kids into school, access other types of healthcare, fix their roofs, start a small business, connect to electricity. And my challenge, I guess, the global health people is that sometimes I fear we are very successfully making people live longer lives, but we're making them live longer lives of grinding poverty. 
Hmm. So they, they get more years, but they get more years living in a house without enough food to eat, without any access to education, without a chance to start a small business. And the way we measure things puts a huge emphasis on life expectancy, and that tends to favor global health projects. But I prefer to say that the individual should have the choice on what matters yeah. to them, what the priorities for their family are, and it may not always be health. Hmm. So we've been talking about the efficacy of cash transfers in mostly low and middle income countries. But let's talk about higher income countries like like the US. I know Give Directly has done some work here. What what have you found? How how do cash transfers work in developed economies? So again, the evidence um, of our programs in the US has so far been positive. It's very different because you cannot have the impact that you can have in a very poor country with a very small amount of money. So a thousand dollar lump sum is not going to transform someone's life. We can't in the US in the way that you could in, in a village in Africa provide someone with their very first electricity, their first water supply, their first access to education. Thank goodness the government is usually already providing those things. But it has been remarkable. I mean, we've worked with African-American women in Georgia. We've been working with expectant mothers in Flint, Michigan. Been working uh, Cook County, Chicago. And generally speaking, again, we're finding that people living in poverty in the US can really benefit from these programs. So the general insight that giving poor people money <laughs> allows them to be less poor and access goods is, is the correct one. And it's then a calculation on which populations you want to focus on. And there's another calculation which people are still studying, which is whether it's better to give a one-time lump sum payment so they can make a capital investment or whether to give a monthly support. And, and then final one is the UBI, UBI stuff, which is, is the much point in giving it to you and me? Or is it better to target at the extreme poor? What's your thinking on UBI? Are you in favor? I'm not against it. I'm not against it. I think it's, a, as a former politician, I was an elected politician, I think it's an unbelievably difficult political sell. And I'm not sure we need to have that fight now. I think we can get so far by targeting the money to people in extreme need, rather than having an argument about whether you or I should be receiving the money. So Open Research, which is this, this nonprofit funded largely by Sam Altman, the, the CEO of OpenAI, recently conducted what I think is maybe the largest or one of the largest ongoing cash transfer studies in the U.S. Over three years, they gave $1,000 a month to 1,000 families living in Texas and Illinois. Yeah. The results, I have to say, are a little bit lackluster, a little bit of a mixed bag. You know, they found that people worked a little less, that there were no improvements to their health, that stress levels sort of dropped initially, but that uh, was erased over time. I'm, I'm sure you followed this research. What's, what's your take on it? Should we be discouraged by it? I think we, you have to pay attention to research. And I thank goodness to Sam Altman for doing this and thank goodness for him studying it rigorously. I think we have to do more studies and we have to try to understand more about this because the evidence from Sub-Saharan Africa is overwhelmingly positive. So we have to understand what's the difference. My gut instinct is that one difference, as I say, is that in the US you're dealing with a wealthier country which already has quite a lot of infrastructure in place, so you can't have the transformatory impact that you have in Africa. I think a second possibility is that often in a village in Africa, the poverty is more straightforward. I mean, the, the multiplier effects are very, very rapid. As soon as you put in a dollar, you get about $2.50 of benefits through the whole economy very, very quickly because they're selling mm -hmm. from a very low base. My instinct in the US is that poverty is very multidimensional, that people's problems may not just be income. It could be mental health, could be addiction issues, mm -hmm. could be the criminal justice system, employment, housing. So, you know, my, my life, I'm afraid, is much more focused on delivering cash to the extreme poor in Africa. I think there has been mm -hmm. some promising research in the US, and I'm proud of the programs we've done in the US. but. 
I'm not completely astonished to discover that Sam Altman's finding some challenges around around those large scale programs. And and remember, this is also not a lump sum program. This is a, a monthly program, which does have some of those issues. You know, uh, my reaction reading reading that research is there is a really long bipartisan history in the U.S. of not trusting poor people with money. FDR called cash assistance a narcotic. Ronald Reagan popularized the myth of welfare queens, that people were just going to waste their welfare checks on Cadillacs. And, you know, even Bill Clinton signed this famous Welfare Reform Act that was supposed to, you know, transform welfare. And really all it seemed to do was make sure that poor people didn't get cash assistance anymore. I mean, in Georgia, the number of families below the poverty line that that got cash went from 98 percent to 7 percent after that legislation. And I look at the reports from Open Research and the results are encouraging, but it's not a slam dunk. And I worry that that is just going to help fuel this decades-long, century-long narrative that, well, just goes to show you poor people can't be trusted with cash. But I just wonder, like, how do you think globally, but here in the U.S. too, how do we overcome that stigma? How do we do that? Well, well, one way of doing it is to take seriously the results from the best European countries, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Switzerland. These are countries which give a lot of cash every month to poor people. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's what a welfare state is. (laughs) They don't give food stamps. They trust people with cash. Now, these societies are not perfect, but the truth of the matter is that Sweden, Norway, Denmark are much more equal, prosperous societies, and the poor in those societies are doing much better than they are in the US. Yeah. So so uh, that's the sort of national scale program that I would be looking at. I'd say, look, there in Sweden, you've got a country of 9 million people. They've been doing this for 60 years. Look at the data on equality. Look at their outcomes. And, And there's no doubt that in every country on earth, there is a very, very clear correlation between poverty and poor outcomes in terms of education, health, criminal justice. And those Scandinavian countries have really demonstrated that if you can support the poor, and as I say, they're supporting them with cash, you can create much, much better outcomes as a result. The other thing Sweden seems to be remarkable at is entrepreneurship. I mean, Stockholm has more billion-dollar startups than anywhere else in the world besides Silicon Valley, and Sweden has more startups per capita than the United States. And it seems like both support of the poor and the social safety net that alleviates economic anxiety gives people the backstop they need to then go out and pursue entrepreneurial creativity. Do you think entrepreneurship in high-income countries and low- and middle-income countries goes up as a result of cash? Yes. I mean, there's, there's, there's no doubt at all that, that anybody starting a small business will be aware that capital really matters. You need a bit of money to get off the ground. Mm -hmm. And it's often difficult borrowing that money from a bank. Banks are very reluctant to lend small amounts of money. And then you end up having to pay back a lot of interest. But if you can get a business off the ground, it's remarkable how quickly you can build up savings, build up some regular income. But you also, you know, need to be able to take a bit of risk. And it's very difficult taking risk as an entrepreneur if you've got no safety net or backup at all. Now, I'm not saying Sweden is the answer to everything because in the end, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark are small places. And places with a suite of their own problems, right? And, Hostility and, to, yeah, to exactly. migrants and... Exactly. Yeah. Many, many problems. Um, many, many problems. But we are, in the US and Britain, living in societies where many people feel terribly excluded. There are communities in ex-industrial areas who just feel they have been completely ignored, forgotten, their lives are rubbish, their parents' and grandparents' lives were better, they have no hope of decent, dignified work, and all the other things that go wrong, the opioid addictions and all the other complicated family problems that stem from that. And we should not be overly complacent about our societies or get too mesmerized by the few people who make billions that we're forgetting just how very, very tough and humiliating life is for marginalized poorer communities. 
When we spoke before in December, your advice to Joe Biden was that if he was going to prioritize one thing in his campaign against Donald Trump, it would be restoring the expanded child tax credit. Remind listeners just what that what that child tax credit yeah. is, what well, it did. It, it, it's an amazing thing. So it was brought in during COVID, and it was championed by a remarkable congresswoman from Connecticut called Rosa DeLauro, I think it's now in her early 80s who's been campaigning for this for decades. She got it through, but it was only funded for a year. And the results were spectacular in the US. Millions of people were lifted out of poverty, and then they stopped it. And I was at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, met Rosa DeLauro, and was delighted to see that Kamala Harris has now signed up to this, partly signed up to it, because Tim Walz has done it as a governor. And I am very, very hopeful that that may be the beginning of bringing some of the basic cash assistance. It's not very much, but it makes a huge difference if somebody's struggling to meet their bills. Yeah. So I think that that under the one-year plan that Biden had, it was, I think you got $3,000 a year up to 3600 depending on your income, about half of it dispersed as cash and the rest is a tax credit. And Kamala has now proposed reinstating that $3,600 and for some families in the first year of a child's life, giving them $6,000, which would be, you know, uh, pretty remarkable. So you think this was the influence of, of folks like Tim Walz. This was not the influence of Rory Stewart. No, I'm not taking credit for this at all, but I am so proud that that, that this is an idea that's coming in because I think um, the US is such a spectacular country with so much to be said for it, but the poorest and most vulnerable and marginalized in the US, are, are in, like in my own country, are in an unforgivably bad situation given how wealthy our countries are. And I think that J.D. Vance has also proposed bringing back a higher child tax credit of about $5,000. Are you, are you surprised by that? Or are, you, are you pleased that this seems like maybe the rare bit of bipartisan harmony between these two diametrically opposed campaigns? I think it's amazing. And I'm, I am pleased. And hopefully that reflects the fact that J.D. Vance does understand poor communities. I mean, he, he's, his grandmother in particular came from a very poor community. And I think would understand how much difference it would have made to her life to have that kind of support. When we come back, I ask a personal question, maybe too personal. In Britain, it's very uh, we're very shy about asking people about money, so we never get to get into these kinds of conversations. Plus, Rory offers some surprising reading recommendations. Stay with us. Hey, I'm Gianna Prudenti. And I'm Jamae Jackson Gadsden. We're the hosts of Let's Talk Offline, a new podcast from LinkedIn News and iHeart Podcasts. When you're just starting out in your career, you have a lot of questions like, how do I speak up when I'm feeling overwhelmed? Or, can I negotiate a higher salary if this is my first real job? Girl, yes. Each week, we answer your unfiltered work questions. Think of us as your work besties you can turn to for advice. And if we don't know the answer, we bring in experts who do, like resume specialist Morgan Sanner. The only difference between the person who doesn't get the job and the person who gets the job is usually who applies. Yeah, I think a lot about that quote. What is it like you miss 100 percent of the shots you never take? Yeah, rejection is scary, but it's better than you rejecting yourself. Together, we'll share what it really takes to thrive in the early years of your career without sacrificing your sanity or sleep. Listen to Let's Talk Offline on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I just want to end by asking you a personal question, which is that another thing you said when we spoke before was that growing up, you couldn't understand why anyone would want to make money in their lives, that the sort of goal to go out and, and get rich had no appeal to you. But I'm curious what your own personal relationship with money has been throughout your life and how, if at all, it's been changed by your work with GiveDirectly. That's a great question. It's a great question. And I, 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 in Britain, it's very, uh, we're very shy about asking people about money. So we never get to get into these kinds of conversations. Um, 
I grew up in a comfortable middle class background. My parents were public servants, and I went into the civil service, and then I became a politician. And yeah, I sort of thought that everything was about working for government, not huge salary. But I was lucky to be able to do that because um, I was also came from a comfortable background to allow me to do that in a way that wouldn't have been the case for other people. I think that Give Directly has really shown me how much difference it makes in the lives of the poor. But I do still believe that there's very little direct relationship between getting richer and richer and happier and happier. Mm -hmm. I think you need to have enough to be able to meet your needs. I mean, I think nothing is more miserable than not knowing where your next meal is coming from. But once you are able to live a, a life where you can address your basic needs, then I don't think there's any evidence at all that you know being worth 10 million or 20 million or 100 million makes you any happier. I also realize that I now have um, a mother who's not getting any younger and I have young kids and bills to meet. There are many times when I realize that my youthful idealism is being challenged by the trying to meet the bills. And I, I think my younger self would have been pretty, pretty ashamed about how much time I, I spend worrying about how much I'm earning and how much I'm saving. And I'd like to get back to being more idealistic, distancing from it more, taking more risk, worrying less about it, and recovering some of what I would have felt as a younger person, which is that the honor of life, the splendor of life, the meaning of life lies in forms of energy, commitment, service, achievement, which rarely have much to do with money. Well, you're still idealistic in that you said on the on the TED stage recently that you believe we can end extreme poverty in our lifetimes. It's very TED Talk optimism. Do you really think that's true? I do. I do. I think that actually with direct cash transfers to the extreme poor, we can do it. And in fact, there's evidence that that is almost exactly what's happened in China. The final lift of the final people out of extreme poverty in China was done by direct cash transfer. And it's not very many people. It sounds like a lot, but 700 million people, you know, you, you could do it over three, four years for the kind of budgets we currently have in international development. And if you had the proper public infrastructure and support in place to follow up from that, I think this is something very achievable. There is no reason why in 20 years' time we need to come across people who are only able to eat once every two days. Rory Stewart is Senior Advisor to Give Directly. If you'd like to support the work they do, visit givedirectly.org. There's also a link in the episode notes. As Rory says, even $30 a month can transform the lives of a single family. Today's show was hosted, written, edited, and cut all the things by me, Caleb Bissinger. Mike Toda made it sound good. Rufus Griscom is our executive producer. None of this would have been possible without the team at the LinkedIn Podcast Network. One last thing on the way out. I know I promised to share Rory's reading recommendations. Here you go. One book that I really enjoyed is called Poor Economics, which mm -hmm. is by Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, who are two um, Nobel Prize winning champions of mostly how to do uh, randomized control trials. There's another great book called Portfolios of the Poor hmm. by Daryl Collins, which is a great study of, of how the poor actually use their money. The incredible variety of different uh, tiny saving schemes, investment mechanisms, debt mechanisms, and their cash flow problems. So I think those are two great books for people who are interested in getting in some of the more academic, thoughtful literature around the subject. In terms of sort of bigger books that I've been reading, I'm, I'm sitting here with my Kindle in front of me. I, I read about probably 10 books a week. So I'm, I'm, I'm largely uh, looking at a, a craziness. But one, one that I think is really relevant to the current moment, which I couldn't recommend too strongly is Miami and the Siege, Siege of Chicago by Norman Mailer, hmm. 
which is his description, astonishing description of the 1968 Republican and Democrat conventions. And his incredible unerring eye for the personalities of American politicians, for the way the system works, what the public wants, how speeches are created, how po policy is marginalized. So, so that, that's, that's probably be my, my biggest recommendation, um, unless somebody wants something on dinosaurs, in which case Steve Brusetti, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. What an eclectic mix. Ten books a week. Are you finishing these books, or are, are, we a, are you a skimmer? I, I tend to skim unless I'm really... I mean, the books I really enjoy, like The Norm Mailer, I'll, I'll read slowly, and I'm sure. enjoying Elena Ferranti's My Brilliant Friend, this extraordinary novel by a Neapolitan woman about living in, in a very, very poor environment in, in Naples. But I also read, um, you know, I've been reading Robert Service's biography of Lenin. I, I, I love American crime fiction. I've been reading Michael Connolly. No, he's great good. A, LA, LA crime fiction. And I'm also reading a biography of, of Georg Friedrich Handel, the, the 18th century German British composer. Well, Rory Stewart, it's been such a delight to speak with you. It's been an eye opening conversation. Um, it's inspired me, and I think it's going to inspire a lot of listeners as well. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. 